happens by a common vice of human nature, that we trust most to, and are most seriously frightened at, things which are strange and unknown. Karate, a mysterious, deadly martial art, whose master experiments can easily kill with a single blow, defeat multiple opponents in style and with grace. A fearsome art in which the split second timing of a fist or foot strike determines life or death. Karate, the study and application of multi-purpose martial arts routines comprising techniques inscrutably designed to be used equally well with or without weapons. I'm holding in my hand a reproduction of a 15th century Basilard dagger. A dagger used to pierce chain mail. Very sharp, very pointed, very high quality steel. The Basilard dagger was worn the opposite side to the sword and would have been drawn in a similar fashion to this. Generally used in a descending strike, occasionally the Basilard dagger would be used in a thrusting movement. Would there be any benefit to practicing my dagger thrust without the dagger being present? Would this in itself lead to some kind of useful martial art practice, uh, some way of vanquishing uh, an enemy or an opponent? My dagger thrust without the dagger being present? Karate, an art conceived for use by warriors who had lost their weapons on the bloody battlefields of ancient Japan. An art through which exponents may cultivate the ability to easily smash through rock, brick, stone and bone, and fatally pierce human flesh, even delaying the time of an opponent's death. These stereotypes figure among some of the most common misrepresentations of karate. Certainly very common, they are equally as false, attesting more to populist oriental mythologizing than to the technical material contained in authentic kata, elegant solo choreographed sequences of movements that record karate's ancient techniques, the true records of karate. In dances with weapons, common, often passionately held beliefs regarding origins, design, purpose and function of ancient kata will come under the spotlight of a new, fresh and exciting set of criteria. What if the art of karate never truly existed as an unarmed art of self-defence at all? What if its original source material and technical base was never designed for unarmed fighting, but for something infinitely more sophisticated, practical and effective. So-called traditional karate, despite its mystique and reputation, has, with very few exceptions, failed to live up to expectation in the ultimate fight challenge matches and other similar populist no-holds-barred tournaments where it has performed dismally. It has not held up to the physical opposition of those ignorant of or uninterested in its protocols, its etiquette, grades and titles. Titles like sensei, teacher, mean little inside the proven grounds of a steel combat cage. just one of the harsh modern experimental laboratories that showcase a variety of violent, full contact confrontations today. Dances with Weapons will empower viewers to participate, to go through the clues presented and decide for themselves as to the efficiency and value of karate but with a little help from experienced and qualified academic and martial art experts, 
The destination is arguably one of the most significant discoveries about karate and its parent art Kung Fu ever made. This may well be the most important documentary on the subject since the BBC's iconic Way of the Warrior series. Nagamine Shoshin, a karate master, decorated by the Japanese government, wrote There are as many theories concerning the origins and executions of the kata as there are schools of karate. Some have theorized, for example, that the movements of the kata derived from mimicking the protective movements of animals. Others have speculated that the kata grew out of ancient dance forms. Unfortunately, he continues, the lack of a comprehensive theory of the movements and how they are executed results in less interest in simple practice of the basic movements of the kata. A few of the Okinawans that perhaps worked on the ships in, in trade or went to China for, you know, uh, business or as a representative of Okinawa uh, or as a linguist, as in the case of several of the uh, um, prominent Okina early Okinawan teachers, they picked up some, some uh, Chinese boxing, which is a collective term. They learned some of the forms and obviously saw lots of different martial arts being practiced and they brought some of it back. But what they didn't get was the, what was encoded in the forms. It may seem almost dismissive just to suggest Weapons, kata, um, are the, the core of karate, are at the heart of, of, of karate, which is an art popularly viewed by, by millions as, as, as an unarmed art, um, unarmed self-defense and combat. But to put this properly in context, um, a, a greater understanding of what the Sai is and, and how it was originally used uh, needs to be made clear. And that's uh, what I intend to do next. Uh, was the tool um, that uh, many of the kata techniques were designed to express. Um, this is not a blade and it's merely for catching a weapon and the main working part of the tool is the nub which is used to strike to the limbs and the limbs arms only of an opponent with a view to dis disarming that opponent and, and preventing him uh, using his weapon. Is it the case that a whole range of exotic looking karate techniques are not so exotic if the appropriate tools are used during the performance of the kata? One of the most important points about the way you use Sanchin kata is its arm position. Arms bent with hands open at 45 degrees forming a typically strong position. The 45 degree position actually describes the angle at which to hold the sai in order to defend oneself from an incoming weapon. In the way to use Sanchin, the open hand moves back in an arc, then moves out in a fingertip strike. In a real fight, such a move would be unusable and easy to avoid. The tips of the fingers actually depict the movement of the tip of the psi as it is flipped back. This is the way in which the psi is used, flipping then striking with the nub. A good example of this if we look at um, weapon hand positioning 
is if we look at the Sishan kata from Weichi Ryu Karate. At one point there's a fantastic position where the hand, the arm is cocked like this and there's a, a cocking of the wrist and the uh, index finger and the small finger are pointing up. It looks a bit like rabbit ears. When you ask Weichi Ryu practitioners um, and when you look at forums and different websites, like you'll ask why do we do this? They believe that it's an empty hand form very often and that as a result you're creating more power by striking with your elbow because you've cocked your wrist and because you position your fingers like this. And after a very small amount of research you realise that this doesn't actually work. It doesn't create any more power for developing an upper strike with the elbow. But if you then take the side, which is the weapon of choice for Weichiryu, and you position it against your arm so that it's blocked, the little finger and the index finger point out, like we saw before. And by cocking the wrist, you keep the side close to your elbow. So suddenly the codes are there, and that makes the understanding of karate kata far, far easier than before. And you can find the same forms, the same codes that are hidden, or even not so hidden now, later the obvious in other um, kung fu forms, other karate forms as well. So is it the case that the forms could pull double duty, meaning they could be used with the weapons or they could be used without the weapons? Multi-purpose martial art routines for all eventualities. This documentary is not so much about styles or, 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 or pet theories, but it's really about asking a question that doesn't seem to have been asked at all. Could these forms have been designed solely for weapon use, not to pull double duty, not to be used as um, em empty hand forms, forms self-defense without weapons? Could it be the case that the martial arts routine known as karate kata and in many uh, respects kung fu forms were designed solely for weapon use? Could it be that their use as, uh, for unarmed self-defense is a myth, is a myth that is only now being exposed uh, through mediums such as the ultimate fight challenge, um, combat and cage fighting, um, where we see and where we have seen um, form-based martial arts proving to be very ineffective. I taught Taekwondo at Boston University. I used to have my own school in Boston, and uh, I was Massachusetts state champion four years in a row. I won uh, a couple of big tournaments. I won a U.S. Open tournament. I won, um, I won uh, the Bay State Games. I won like a, f a few pretty big tournaments, and I was trying to get into the Olympics for Taekwondo.
That's one of the beauties of mixed martial arts, isn't it? That really it has debunked a lot of the myths of traditional oh, yeah. martial arts. Yeah. Right? You'd look at old stuff like you know Funakoshi and old Shotokan yeah. videos, and you'd see magazines with different sequences and all these you know Gyakuzuki reverse yeah. punches and Mawashigetis and Maigetis and using yeah. them on the street. And you can't use this stuff yeah. in, in, in mixed martial arts. You know, debunk the myths. But it's it's amazing how many guys still believe it. I love watching all that nonsense be exposed because I was a victim of it myself to a certain extent with Taekwondo. I was like, man, I've gotten really good at something that's dumb. Faith, fanatic faith, once wedded fast to some dear falsehood, hugs it to the last. have engaged in serious conflict in many shapes, guises and forms, and on every continent for millennia. If we think of war, inevitably, we will think of weapons. But it seems there's an exception. Unarmed martial arts like karate are popularly viewed as a means to wage war with little more than our bare hands, albeit on a limited scale. Hand is my sword, for example, is a famous karate book title. Soldiers and warriors must be armed, after all, even if it is only with a deadly pair of hands. Historically, members of the public have been armed, too. Unarmed civil society is a recent phenomenon, even in the UK. It does seem strange that often, when a flare-up of civil unrest occurs, all kinds of weapons suddenly appear on the streets, yet empty hand arts do not figure prominently there. Sticks, stones, bottles and bricks seem preferable to karate kicks, so to speak. In reality, sensible warriors have always conducted their business by being as well armed and equipped as possible. Mystique aside, bare-handed fighting or being unarmed is the least desirable of options in any serious conflict. for me to perform the same actions, the opening of the stock, the loading of the magazine and the bringing onto target of the assault rifle without the rifle. Let's take a look. Would that in itself constitute a reasonable and useful and practical thing to do in terms of learning to use an assault rifle or practicing with one.
Karate chops and high kicks, contorted faces and piercing screams epitomise unarmed oriental martial arts for me. Yet in respect of traditional karate, out of the several hundreds of movements that comprise traditional kata, kicking techniques comprise less than 10% of the total repertoire. And much karate is claimed to be based on Sanchin, a kata set by pioneering karate masters like Miyagi Chojin and Yamaguchi Gogen to be the foundation and the beginning and end of karate. Sanchin features prominently in many karate styles in which the kata is performed with a closed fist. It is common knowledge that Miyagi Chojin's teacher, Higashiyama Kanuro, originally learned and practiced Sanji with open hands. Contemporary understanding of Sanji does not ascribe much in the way of technical applications to the kata. Rather, the method of validating Sanji practice involves something known as shimmy testing. Some styles use shimmy testing and sanjin as a method of checking strength and posture as well as concentration. Students are struck, slapped, punched and kicked during the performance of the kata. The method of stepping in this kata the staccato-like movements is the same as that found in a karate kata. The kimei, that's the focus in this weapons kata, and indeed in most karate kata, betrays weapons use. The focus is to prevent the weapon from jumping out of one's hand. The thrust, for instance, similar to that used in a handheld wood axe, is to arrest the weapon. Are we being asked to accept that the same format is practical without the weapons? Ballistic percussive combat arts tend not to halt their blows, but rather to follow through with no jerking. My name's Andy Kundi and um, I, my background in karate is I've been training now for just over 28 years. Um, I originally had a Shotokan karate background with the Karate Union of Great Britain. I was, a, I was a black belt in that system. I suppose um, fundamentally it was the it was the kata. Um, I'd always been very interested in the in the kata within the Shotokan system, um, and really the the explanations I've been given for what the, the function of the kata um, weren't particularly consistent uh, in, in my mind. It's it's a very to me, it was, it was originally quite a difficult concept to grasp, and I think, in common with many, many of my training partners, we've been brought up that very much karate was an empty hand art, an empty hand art, and the katas were for empty hand fighting. And, um, and really, the, um, the suggestion that they were for, for weapons, originally you think, well, no, that can't be right. But then you, then you see the evidence, and I think that's the key thing. To me, um, my, my background is in science, and so, very much um, I can see how the kata provide evidence, very clear evidence um, for, for, for weapon use, you know, for being a way of cataloguing weapons usage and the um, using the kata with the with, with, with psi weapons is um, to me um, fits the form much more effectively than actually having them as, as, as anti-hand forms.
I started as a teenager, I started to practice some classical Japanese weapons arts. And it's that actually that gave me an insight into karate kata and why exactly they don't work because weapons distances and empty hand distances are different, they're so different and the difference is absolutely critical. Uh, when you're dealing with weapons, the distance must be greater. And if you look at all the demonstrations of karate kata techniques, you'll notice they all start from a great distance, uh, almost having to sort of jump in to perform a technique. Well, that's a weapons distance. And uh, that's easily recognisable for anyone who has any inkling of how to use weapons. Nai Hanchen, an important shurute kata practiced by many styles, including Shotokan karate. Nai Hanchen is a long exercise in blocking and punching, usually broken down into three parts. Nai Hanchen exemplifies the problem of kata. It is an extremely choreographed kata, and the random nature of fighting means that choreographed movements do not work. It is not possible to predict where an attack will come from. Anything could happen. The working distance is the immeasurable gap between two opponents when fighting. The revealing factor has been that the working distances shown in the ancient kata are not that of a fist fight. In a real fight, the working distance is more like this. As shown in numerous TV shows, like the ultimate fighting competition, real fights, especially those against multiple opponents, work on much tighter distances most fights being reduced to a wrestling or grappling situation. It is only with weapons that the ancient karate kata working distances can be seen. In further support of this, we can see that those who have training based in traditional forms, who wish to enter ultimate fight challenge competitions or steel cage fighting tournaments, or whatever they, they become known as, the more those people train for those events, the more their practice and their uh, techniques resemble cage fighting, and the less they resemble the traditional kata. My name is Fred Etish. I am a martial artist, a mixed martial artist, and a, basically a jack of all trades. During my fight, I had really have no true recollection of what I was thinking or what was going through my mind after I got into the cage. Psychologically, mentally, I had pretty much checked out. I was unable to focus, unable to concentrate, 
and the whole thing to me is fairly surreal. Looking back, it's almost like a dream. After the fight, I was made fun of as a mixed martial artist. I was made fun of as a traditional martial artist. I was kind of a pariah in both worlds. You know, many traditional martial arts people were very angry at me because I went to the UFC in the first place. And after I went, I performed so poorly. After 15 years of not fighting, I came back to do at least one more fight. And I did it because of some things that were inside of me that for 15 years I was unable to put to rest. I really wanted before I got too old to try and go out and represent myself in a way that I, that I thought I could be proud of. So at the tender age of 53, I gave it a shot. I fought a young guy up in Minnesota who was probably about my son's age or maybe a little bit younger and I happened to come away with the win in the first round. One historical question is that of why the karate and related martial arts like Kung Fu seem to have appeared and, 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 and arisen only in the East. I'd like to put forward an answer to that question in the following way. It is only in China that we find a weapons ban at the end of the Ming Dynasty in 1644. It is only in that environment that we see weapons experts, civil arrest experts, unable to use their weapons, unable to practice them either in public or in private as a result of that weapons ban. And we see perhaps, perhaps, the retaining of those skills, the practices remembered committed to mnemonic devices called forms, kata, sing, uh, to retain those skills with the weapons being absent so as not to attract unwelcome, punitive action from the Manchu authorities who had imposed draconian, draconian rules against weapons ownership, weapons use, or anything military.